Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Let's take up the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper. There are three articles in today's newspaper related to the collapse of Yes Bank and the reconstruction plan that RBI is trying to put in place. But before we get into this topic, first let us understand the factors behind the collapse of Yes Bank and why the Indian banking and financial sector is severely stressed. See, Yes Bank is a private Indian bank and it is one of the major private banks to be established in the post-LPG era. After India liberalized its economy, the RBI started giving out licenses for private banks. One such private banking license was obtained by Rana Kapoor and Ashok Kapoor from RBI and they established Yes Bank in 2004. See, the success or failure of any bank is based on the manner in which it manages its assets and liabilities. In order to understand this statement, first you need to understand what constitutes an asset and what constitutes a liability according to a bank. See, from a bank's perspective, the loans that it gives out is considered to be an asset to the bank and the deposits that it receives is considered to be a liability to the bank. The deposits that we make in savings account, current account, fixed deposits, recurring deposits, etc. is what gives a bank the ability to lend money to borrowers. But whenever depositors demand to withdraw their deposits, banks have to honor this demand and hence deposits constitute a liability to the bank. But on the other hand, loans are given out to individuals and corporations and these borrowers are obligated to pay back the loans with interest. So this brings in long-term revenue to the bank and hence loans are considered as an asset by the bank. So if a bank has to function in a stable manner and if it has to maintain a healthy balance sheet, then it needs to strike a balance between its assets and liabilities. So while giving out loans, a bank should always ensure that it is exercising adequate caution and care in order to verify the repayment capacity of the borrower. And a bank should always ensure that it is in a position to honor the demands of the depositors at any given point of time. So if these basic principles of banking are not followed, then its impact will be felt on the balance sheet of the bank. See, you might have heard that the Indian banking sector is under severe stress due to rising NPAs. NPA stands for non-performing asset. It basically means that an asset has stopped performing, which means the borrower has stopped repaying the loans. Due to financial mismanagement in a bank, if NPAs continue to increase consistently, then there will come a point where the bank will no longer be in a position to honor the demand of its depositors. This is when we say a bank has failed or a bank has collapsed. Now you might ask, why didn't the failed bank exercise adequate caution in the first place while giving out these risky loans which were bound to turn into a non-performing asset? The answer to this question lies in these three factors. See, since loans are an asset to the bank, banks are generally motivated to give out easier loans in order to generate more revenue. Then the government and the RBI might encourage the banks to give out easier loans in order to promote economic growth. And the third most important reason is corrupt and fraud practices within the bank's management, as a result of which they give out huge loans to unworthy borrowers despite being aware of their inability to repay these loans. It is a combination of these factors which pushes a bank to default on its payments. In the recent past, we have seen many such cases in India. First, we had the fall of the Punjab and Maharashtra Cooperative Bank where innocent depositors lost their money. Next, we saw the collapse of IL and FS, which is a major player in the infrastructure financing sector. And now, we have witnessed the collapse of Yes Bank. In all the three cases, the major contributor was corruption, fraud and mismanagement on the part of the bank. See, if you look at Yes Bank's performance 
between 2004 and 2014, it was initially focused on liabilities. It was focused upon honoring the demands of its depositors. So as a result, there was a healthy balance between its asset and liability ratio. But post-2014, the bank took an aggressive turn towards lending and it started giving out high-risk loans. If you look at this period, the total loans given out by Yes Bank stood at 55,000 crores as compared to the deposits it held, which was at 74,000 crores. Whereas post-2014, its loans had increased to 2.24 lakh crore rupees and most of them had turned into NPAs. So as a result, it could not honor the demands of its depositors who had deposited around 2.09 lakh crore rupees in the bank. According to data given out by the RBI, Yes Bank's NPAs stood at 7.39% in September 2019, but during the initial period, its NPAs were hardly at 0.31%. So this huge increase in NPAs is what contributed to the collapse of Yes Bank and the reason why NPAs increased is because Yes Bank had given out high-risk loans to troubled and failed companies such as IL&FS, Divan Housing, Anil Ambani Group, Cafe Coffee Day Group, etc. So from 2015-16 onwards, the asset quality of Yes Bank started to decline and the borrowers started to default on their payments. But despite this, the outgo of money kept on increasing because the bank still had to honor the demands of its depositors. And the bank even continued to give out high-risk loans during this period. So this is when the RBI started asking questions. And this led to the exposure of governance and financial mismanagement issues at the bank. By this time, Yes Bank had started under-reporting its NPAs and losses through fraud practices. And due to the losses being incurred by the bank, it started losing its value in the stock market and hence it failed to raise fresh capital. Post-2017, the RBI understood the seriousness of the issue and it started interfering with the management of the bank. By 2019, the RBI had asked Rana Kapoor to quit from his position and the new governing board was given one last chance by the RBI to revive the bank and keep the bank from failing. But over the last one year, problems further increased for Yes Bank as the losses were increasing and it failed to raise any fresh capital. So before the bank could fail completely and default on its payments, the RBI decided to step in just a couple of days ago and it has imposed a moratorium on Yes Bank. This moratorium will be in place from the 5th of March to the 3rd of April and during this period, Yes Bank will seize all its operations for the time being and the RBI has superseded the governing board and it has appointed an administrator and a new board on its behalf. And in order to prevent the bank from defaulting on its payments, the RBI has capped withdrawals from depositors at 50,000 rupees during the moratorium period. So this moratorium period would be used by the RBI in order to reconstruct and revive the bank and accordingly, the RBI has already come out with a draft reconstruction scheme. According to this reconstruction plan, the RBI has asked the State Bank of India to step in and acquire a 49% stake in Yes Bank in order to infuse fresh capital. The RBI has given itself a 30-day deadline to prevent the bank from failing and revive it within this time period in order to ensure that it doesn't have a spillover effect on the Indian economy. The RBI has also said that the liabilities and obligations of Yes Bank will continue to remain the same after the moratorium period. This means that the depositors will be able to fully withdraw their amount after the moratorium period and the borrowers will have to continue making the repayments as earlier. The RBI has also assured that the reconstruction plan will not affect the lower and mid-level employees of Yes Bank and its branches. But however, the new governing board can decide to cut salaries and even terminate senior officials who are occupying key managerial positions. Such revival of a failed organization by the government or by the RBI 
is technically referred to as a bailout. But the question is, why should the government or the RBI bail out such organizations which have failed primarily due to their mismanagement? See, the reason why such failed organizations are bailed out is because when such large organizations fail or collapse, it tends to have a spillover effect or a domino effect on the entire sector and as well as on the entire economy. Because such large banks or corporations or even companies, they will have significant exposure to various other sectors and the fall of such a large organization will have a contagion effect on not just that sector but across multiple sectors. So restructuring and reviving such failed organizations becomes essential in the larger interest of the economy. But at the end of the day, it is the innocent taxpayer and the honest depositors who are always at the receiving end. Because the depositor not only stands to lose his hard-earned money, but it is the taxpayer's money which is used again to compensate for the losses incurred due to the mismanagement and corrupt and fraud practices of these large banks and corporations. In fact, the same was done by the Indian government when Satyam computers collapsed. The same was done by the United States as well during the 2008-2009 financial crisis, which was triggered by the subprime mortgage crisis and the fall of Lehman Brothers. During this financial crisis, the US government used taxpayers' money to bail out a number of companies which had fallen mainly due to their mismanagement and corrupt practices. The irony in the reconstruction plan of Yes Bank is that the State Bank of India, which is a public sector bank, has been pushed by the government of India and the RBI to acquire a stake in a private bank which also happens to be its rival. So essentially, depositors' money and taxpayers' money from another public sector bank is being used to revive a failed private bank. So that's the reason why the bailout of such failed organizations always turns out to be very controversial. And the last point that we need to understand is as to what happens to depositors' money if a bank fails completely. See, if a bank fails completely to honor the demands of its depositors, then the Deposit Insurance and Credit Guarantee Scheme will come into operation. This scheme is run by the Deposit Insurance and Credit Guarantee Corporation. This corporation is entirely owned by the RBI. It was established in 1978 under the Deposit Insurance and Credit Guarantee Corporation Act of 1961 in order to deal with such crisis. Under this scheme, your deposits in a bank are insured and if a bank fails to honor your deposits, then you are compensated up to the maximum limit of 5 lakh rupees. This insurance scheme has been extended to all banks and it covers nationalized banks, private banks, foreign banks which have branches in India, and as well as cooperative banks. It also covers all types of deposits that you make in a bank. It covers your savings account, current account, fixed deposits, and recurring deposits. And the premium for this insurance has to be paid by the respective banks. But the drawback of the scheme is that, irrespective of the amount you have deposited in a bank, the maximum compensation that you are entitled to receive is 5 lakh rupees. Even if you have deposited 10 lakh rupees or maybe 10 crore rupees in a bank and if the bank fails, then the maximum compensation you will receive is 5 lakh rupees under the deposit insurance scheme. Until recently, this insured amount was just 1 lakh rupees and after the PMC bank crisis, the government of India has increased the insurance amount to 5 lakh rupees during the last month's budget. Now let's take up the next article. A constitution bench of the Supreme Court has passed an important ruling related to the Land Acquisition Act of 2013. See the right to fair compensation and transparency in Land Acquisition, Rehabilitation and Resettlement Act of 2013 replaced the Colonial Era Land Acquisition Act of 1894 and it came into effect from the 1st of Jan 2014. But under the new Land Acquisition Act, Section 24 turned out to be highly controversial because according to this provision, any land acquired by the government five years prior to the new Act, that is between the period 2008 to 2013, would lapse 
if the government has not taken physical possession of the land or if compensation amount has not been paid to the landowner. So according to section 24 of the new Land Acquisition Act of 2013, such land acquisition was deemed to be lapsed and the land was supposed to be returned to the landowner. And if the government desires to acquire this land again, then it has to be acquired according to the provisions of the new act by paying fair compensation. So this provision led a number of landowners whose land had been acquired during this period to approach the court and demand that the acquired land be returned to them as the compensation amount had still not been paid to them by the government. These cases went through a series of hearings and the government argued that the compensation amount has been deposited into the government treasury and this compensation would be released very soon to the landowners. So the argument of the government was that provisions of section 24 won't apply if the compensation amount has already been deposited in the treasury. In the Pune Municipal Corporation case of 2014, a coordinate bench of the court favoured the landowners and it ordered the government to return such land back to them. Then in the Indoor Development Authority case of 2018, a three-judge bench of the Supreme Court reversed this earlier judgment and it favoured the stand taken by the government. The matter further reached a five-judge constitution bench of the Supreme Court and it has upheld the earlier judgment that was delivered in the Indoor Development Authority case. So as per the judgment of the Supreme Court, land acquisition that has been made during this period shall not lapse if the compensation amount has been deposited to the Treasury and hence provisions of section 24 shall not apply to such land acquisitions. Now let's take up an article that is related to NGOs and pressure groups. See NGOs and pressure groups play a very crucial role in a democracy because they represent the voices of various sections of the society including the minorities and the weaker sections. These organizations represent various interest groups including farmers, students, various castes, communities and even languages. Such NGOs and pressure groups primarily work towards the promotion of social and political welfare of their respective interest groups. They also play a key role in the implementation and execution of various government schemes at the grassroots and they also highlight the concerns of their interest groups to the government and they are able to influence policy making as well. That's the reason why NGOs and pressure groups are considered as a key pillar in a democracy to deliver good governance. These organizations raise funds through donors which includes the government itself. They also raise funding through private companies, through donations and contributions received from the members of their interest group and they also raise funds through foreign donors. The issue of funding received by NGOs and pressure groups has become controversial over the years because some of these organizations could be funded by vested interests. There have been instances where some of these organizations have been funded by foreign governments, foreign intelligence agencies and even by foreign companies and foreign based NGOs in order to derail the policies and strategic objectives of the Indian government. This aspect of funding is governed by the Foreign Contribution Regulation Act of 2010 and the Foreign Contribution Regulation Rules of 2011. Under these laws, the Government of India has been empowered to declare any such organization as a political organization and subsequently it can deny these organizations from receiving foreign funding. But it has also been observed that the Indian government has been misusing these provisions in order to target genuine NGOs and pressure groups as well just because they are protesting against the government. So in this context, the Supreme Court has passed a ruling and it has directed the central government that it cannot brand any organization as a political organization and deprive them of foreign funding without a valid reason. The Supreme Court has recognized the role of NGOs and pressure groups in promoting social welfare and it has upheld their right to protest through legitimate and peaceful means and it has also upheld their right to receive foreign funds as per the provisions of FCRA. The Supreme Court has said 
that if an organization has openly stated that it is a political organization or if it has clearly outlined its political objectives in its memorandum of association or in its bylaws or if it has clearly established political motives only then the government can invoke the provisions of FCRA if it has been established without a doubt that the organization has been receiving funding from vested interest in that case the government has every right to cut off foreign funding and brand such organizations as political organizations but otherwise the government cannot misuse the provisions of FCRA in order to target ngos and pressure groups just because they have been protesting against government policies now let's take up the next article india has joined the indian ocean commission as an observer see the indian ocean commission is a regional organization involving five african countries that are located in the western indian ocean this includes comoros madagascar mauritius french reunion which is an overseas territory of france and seychelles the admission of india to this grouping as an observer state is very very significant because earlier in 2016 the grouping had already given the observer status to china then in 2017 the grouping had given the observer status to the international organization of the francophonie which is a grouping of 54 french speaking countries then in the same year the european union and as well as malta were admitted as observer states to the indian ocean commission so india joining the grouping as an observer state is a very significant development because india has a lot of interest in the western indian ocean as a part of its indo pacific strategy see as a part of its indo pacific strategy india has been extensively focusing upon the indian ocean region and it has been projecting itself as a net security provider for the region in order to guarantee maritime security and the economic security of the smaller island nations in the indian ocean region this is a part of india's strategy to counter the growing influence of china in the indian ocean region and as well as to project itself as a major power in the indo pacific region which is becoming increasingly significant as a part of this indo pacific strategy india has been paying a lot of attention to the western indian ocean due to its geo strategic significance see in the western indian ocean you have strategic choke points such as the mozambique channel and as well as the strait of hormuz in the mozambique channel china has already established a strong naval presence and in fact it has very close military relations with most of the east african countries such as kenya tanzania and even mozambique China has even established a naval base in Djibouti and Strait of Hormuz has always been a flashpoint due to increasing tensions between US and Iran then you have Suez Canal over here through which most of the trade between Europe and Asia passes through this trade route passes through the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden and as it enters the western indian ocean it encounters the somalian pirates apart from this The United States also has a very strong military presence in the Indian Ocean region through its naval base in Diogo Garcia which is located somewhere over here. So all these factors have pushed India to pursue closer relations with these five African countries that are located in the Western Indian Ocean. As a part of these efforts, India has managed to gain the observer status at the Indian Ocean Commission. Now let's take up the practice questions which condition is ideal for harvesting a bumper wheat crop during the ripening stage the correct answer is option b we need bright sunlight minimal rainfall and still winds in order to harvest a bumper wheat crop this question has been asked because we have a related article on page number 5 according to this article unprecedented rainfall in punjab and haryana caused by western disturbances is likely to affect the harvest of wheat crop see wheat is essentially grown as a rabi crop between october and march it is sown between october and december because cold conditions are required for germination and initial growth so that's the reason why wheat is referred to as a winter crop 
but the crop is harvested in Feb and March and the ideal conditions for a bumper harvest include bright sunlight, no rainfall and still winds. But every year, wheat crops in Western India are threatened by Western disturbances which originate in the Mediterranean Sea and these disturbances bring rainfall and high-speed winds which have the potential to destroy the wheat crop. Now let's take up the second practice question. Which of the following statements are correct? Border Area Development Program aims to meet the special development needs of the people living in remote and inaccessible areas situated near the international border and to saturate the border areas with the essential infrastructure through convergence of central, state, BADP and local schemes and through participatory approach. It is implemented by the Ministry of Defence. Amongst the given statements, the second statement is incorrect because the Border Area Development Program is implemented by the Ministry of Home Affairs. So the correct answer is option A, one only. This question has been asked because we have a related article on page number 6. This article makes a reference to the Border Area Development Program. See, this program was launched during the 7th 5-year plan and initially it was meant only for the western sector that is India's borders with Pakistan. Later, the scheme has been extended to cover all the states which have an international land border and it is currently being implemented in 17 states. The main objective of this program is to promote socio-economic development in the border areas that are located within 10 kilometers from the international border. So under this program, initiatives such as creation of infrastructure, provision of economic opportunities, etc. are taken up in order to instill a sense of security amongst the border villages. In this article, the government of Arunachal Pradesh has expressed concern about the lack of economic opportunities in the border areas with China and how this situation is pushing the people of Arunachal Pradesh to migrate to other urban centers of India. So basically, the border areas of Arunachal Pradesh are witnessing a depopulation due to the lack of economic opportunities. Hence, the state government is seeking to stop border migration through the better implementation of border area development program by working closely with the Ministry of Home Affairs. Then the article also mentions that Arunachal Pradesh shares a 1080 km border with China, 440 km border with Myanmar and 160 km border with Bhutan. These map-based facts can be very important for prelims. Now let's take up the next practice question. Amak News Agency is considered as a popular media outlet based out of Qatar, an Indian media channel banned by the Indian government for biased coverage, a news outlet linked to the Islamic State, a Middle East-based media outlet which won the Pulitzer Prize for its coverage of the Syrian conflict. The correct answer is option C. The Amak News Agency is considered to be the official media outlet of the ISIS. This question has been asked because we have a related article on page number 14. Just days after the signing of a peace deal between the United States and Taliban, a major terror attack has been carried out in Kabul and the attack has been claimed by ISIS through its official media outlet that is the Amak News Agency. Now let's take up a map-based question. Kachativo Island of Sri Lanka is considered to be an important cultural connection between India and Sri Lanka due to the presence of which shrine? The correct answer is option C, Saint Anthony Shrine. Please look at this map. This is where the Kachativo Island is located. It is located between the Gulf of Manar and the Park Strait. See, in some of the previous sessions, we have spoken about the maritime dispute between India and Sri Lanka over the Kachativo Island. We have discussed how India handed over the island to Sri Lanka in 1974 in the interest of promoting good relations. We have even spoken about the Kachativo Island while discussing the fishermen dispute between India and Sri Lanka. But apart from this, Kachativo Island also represents a very important cultural link between the two countries. Because every year in the month of Feb and March, Pilgrims from Tamil Nadu, especially coastal Tamil Nadu and Rameshwaram, they participate in the St. Anthony's Church Festival, which is held on the Kachativo Island. Now let's take up another map-based question. Idlib, which is frequently in news, is located in which country? 
The correct answer is option B. It is located in Syria. To be more specific, it is located in northwestern part of Syria. This question has been asked because we have a related article on page number 14. According to this article, Russia and Turkey have worked out a ceasefire agreement in order to bring the conflict in Idlib to an end. Now let's take up a practice question from the 2017 prelims paper. Which of the following statements are correct regarding the Monetary Policy Committee? It decides the RBI's benchmark interest rates. It is a 12-member body including the governor of RBI and is reconstituted every year. It functions under the chairmanship of the Union Finance Minister. Amongst the given statements, only the first statement is correct, so option A is the right answer. See, the Monetary Policy Committee is a six-member body that is reconstituted once in every four years. Its composition includes the Governor of RBI, the Deputy Governor of RBI, and a member nominated by the RBI. Plus, there are three members nominated by the Government of India. And the Chairman of the Monetary Policy Committee is the Governor of RBI. In fact, he is the ex-officio chairperson of the Monetary Policy Committee. Finally, let's take up a couple of mains practice questions. The first question, discuss the significance of India gaining the observer status to the Indian Ocean Commission. The second question, elaborate how risky lending and rising NPAs have affected the Indian banking sector with suitable examples. So kindly write an answer to these questions and post them in the comment section below. So this concludes our discussion for the day. Thanks for watching.